Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday service. I'd like to share with you a familiar verse from Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, and it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes there's not much pure about us, especially when we try to do things in our own strength. So we come to you this morning with open hands, nothing to give you, nothing we can offer but ourselves. And Lord, you take us, you take the insipid waters of our being and our offering and you make it into a glorious wine as you did at Cana in Galilee. We are pure, not because of our own strength, but by your grace. And so as we are purified by coming into here and offering ourselves to you, so Lord, in this, in this service today, we seek your face. Amen. Continuing in reading from uh, Matthew, I'm reading verse chapter 18, verse 15 to 20. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even then to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. And as we ponder on those words, I look forward to what Johnson will bring to us from those beautiful words. One of my favourite books is Colossians, and in Colossians 3.12 it says this, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that as we come this morning, we know that we can trust in you. Thank you that when I come into your presence, you take away and melt away anything that is unloving within me. Free me from the myth of my own self-sufficiency. Free me from the, the lie that I can go through this life on my own. Release me from the shames that shackle me and take me away from the enticements of a hollow world and what it offers. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness, Lord, as I pray that you would draw us into a deeper relationship with you, a relationship that motivates us to do things not because we're frightened of what the consequences will be, not because of duty, not because we want to look good, but Lord, our prayer is that all of our actions will emanate from that deep and wonderful and beautiful relationship with you. A relationship that so often we turn away from. But Lord, we ask this morning that you would draw us deeper into it. That you would cleanse our thoughts, our hearts. That we might truly love you and worship you. Lord, give us the sharpness of vision to focus on you. Give us the purity of heart to see you. Give us the clarity of healing that we may hear your voice above all others. Lord, give us, the, above all, the passion to follow you gladly and trustfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as I said, I'm looking forward to Johnson's message as he comes and brings it to us. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Russell, for the prayers and the reading of the Word of God. Good morning to you all. It's midweek service, and we want to thank God 
that has allowed us to come together and listen again to the Word of God. Uh, this morning I have decided to share with you on the theme, When Christians Quarrel, Resolving Conflict in the Church. How to Resolve Conflict in the Church When Christians Quarrel. One of the things I like best about the New Testament is that it is so practical. It must have been the fact that Jesus had human beings called disciples always with him that forced him to speak in such everyday terms about everyday problems. Sometimes Christians disagree in the congregation of believers. Sometimes they quarrel. Sometimes they hold grudges against each other. The scripture for today says that we must never tolerate any situation in which there is a breach of personal relationship between us and another member of the Christian community. In this 18th chapter of Matthew, Jesus admits that Jesus, disciples were going to have conflicts, but that resolved them. It is very true today that the behavior of us church members on this very issue makes Christianity to the outside world either repulsive or attractive. It isn't a matter that Christians are perfect and will not have conflicts. There will always be quarrels, differences of opinion on how and who, disappoints with preachers, and counsels, hate feelings, bent pride, loss of faith, and a lot of mistakes. It is the idea that Christians can resolve these conflicts as no other fellowship can, that Jesus puts before us. We don't cast people out of church very often nowadays if you do something wrong. For no, no, no one thing, we would, would draw the line. For one thing, where would we draw the line? Murder, adultery, using crude language, smoking, criticizing the pastor. Well, maybe the last one, criticizing the pastor. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. According to scripture, we are all sinners. If we start casting out people because of their sins, we are going to have a small church or no church at all. No, the answer is not exclusion. The answer is to build a church that is so loving, so committed, that people grow in their commitment to Christ and to one another. We want a church where people are built up, not cast out. Commas, a juke, had a saying that indicated the limitations of his religion. You shall read that we are commanded to forgive our enemies, but you never read that we are commanded to forgive our friends. That can happen in the Christian proclamation of the gospel. We spend a lot of time in our pulpits talking about how Christians are admonished by Jesus Christ to love their enemies and to pray for their enemies. When in actuality, right there, in the pew, side by side, are Christians who hold grudges. Hang on pet issues, has refused to forgive and love each other within the fellowship. We found that within the church, not outside. So, and when they do this, church and Christianity and the whole practice of religion for them is not the joyful experience it ought to be. They miss the light dimension of belonging to God's family. So this particular portion of Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 18, gives us a whole scheme of action for the mending of broken relationship within our family of God, called the Christian fellowship. Jesus advises, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault, between you and him alone. So the first rule Jesus gives us is that if anyone has wronged us, we should immediately put our complaint into words. One of the biggest mistakes we can make is not to voice our head. To just brood out about it can be fatal. That can poison our whole life until we can think of anything else but our own head. Our own personal injury becomes the whole center of our life. A lot of times just voicing such head can help. And Jesus knew that. He said, go and tell him. Many times... Just putting our disgruntlement into words will help us put into its proper perspective. It may even seem trivial or less important when we do this. And most of the time, I've seen people that don't tell the brother or sister. They first gossip about it. 
And that is the worst thing. There are so many times when we just must not suffer our head in a sort of brooding silence. That's the worst thing we can do. So the first rule that Jesus gives us to resolve conflict, tell it, speak it, get it out into the open. Tell the person. Ivan Stone in Love Eternal concludes this narrative account of Mary Todd and Abraham Lincoln with an interview between Miss Lincoln and Parker, the president's guard. Parker entered a heavy-faced man with half-closed lips. He trembled. Where were you? Were you not at the door to keep the assassin out? She asked fiercely. Parker hung his head. I have bitterly repented it. But I did not believe that anyone would try to kill so a good man in such a public place. The belief made me carelessly. I was attracted by the play. I did not see the assassin enter the box. You should have seen him. He had no business to be careless. She fell back on the pillow, covered her face with her hands. Go now. It's not you I can't, I can't forgive. It's the assassin. If Papa had lived, said Ted, you would have forgiven the man who shot him. Papa forgave everyone. Second, we are advised to see the person in person. Jesus says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. In Matthew 18 verse 15. And then he adds the beautiful thought, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If we have a difference with someone, Jesus says to settle it face to face. It seems to me that Jesus is warning against writing letters, text messages, complaining to someone else and all such things. To write a letter or text a message can bring on more misunderstanding. While Christians can deal with each other face to face. Humans who are in Christ can deal with each other differently. Being aware of our own shortcomings and still having God's forgiveness, we can deal with each other in a compassionate way, allowing forgiveness. Knowing also make mistakes, we can allow others the same privilege. Emery Parks tells, when the books of a certain Scotch doctor were examined after his death, it was found that a number of accounts were closed out with a note forgiven. Too poor to pay. But the physician's wife decided that their accounts must be paid and proceeded to sue for the money. The judge asked one person, is this your husband's hand in writing? When she replied that it was, he said, then there is no tribunal in the land that can obtain this money when he has written the word forgiven. So Jesus says to go personal, a letter can be misread, a text can be misread and misunderstood. It can convey a tone which it never meant to convey. Jesus says this, if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. That's a beautiful picture. We make the effort to take the first step. Go in Christian love and there's a bonus in it for us. We have a brother or a sister. Those with whom we have struggled and resolved conflict became, uh, become the most precious of us to all. Our purpose is not to humiliate or condemn but to gain a brother or a sister, to gain him or her for friendship and for the church of Christ. I read a story by Roy Packett. Once a boy went out of his home to do something that his parent felt was wrong. He was involved in an accident and lost both legs. It was a terrible blow. He said when his mother and father saw him in the hospital court lying there, aware that he had lost both legs, he said, will you forgive me? The boy, they both ran up and hugged him and said, of course, we've already forgiven you. And he answered, then I can live without my legs. So the first step Jesus advised us to tell them, the second is to go personal. You need to go personal and talk to the person. And the third step is to take some wise Christians with you. He puts it, but if he does not listen to you, Take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. In Deuteronomy 19 verse 15, one witness shall not rise up against a man for an inquiry or for an sin, no doubt method that in mind saying, 
But in this case, you don't take others along to prove wrongdoing, but rather to help the reconciliation. It may well be that we are the ones, not the other person, who are in the wrong. Yet often develops against those whom we have wronged or who have wronged us. It's sometimes so that we just can't say or do the right thing to resolve the conflict ourselves. There are always those few saints who work reconciliation. Just called them peacemakers. Jesus called them peacemakers. If we talk things over with a wise person, that person can often help us see ourselves as other seers. The rabbi said, a wise saying, judge not, for none may judge alone, save one. That is God. So the third step is to ask for help. Father, forgive them. Those were Christ's words, words of sharp contrast to the words of the world. Louis Antame in Henry Henrik Hain, paradox and poet, described the spirit of the world. Forgiving was not Hain's business, nor his speciality. My nature is the most peaceful in the world, he wrote with deceptive mildness. All I ask is a simple cottage, a decent bed, good food, some flowers in front of my window, and few trees beside my door. Then if God wanted me to completely be happy, he would let me enjoy the spectacle of six or seven of my enemies dangling from these trees. I would forgive them all their wrongs they've done for me. Forgive them from the bottom of my heart, for we must forgive our enemies, but not until they are hanged. The fourth step is, according to Jesus, is if all that fails, we must take our personal troubles to the Christian fellowship. It is true that with the Christian fellowship, if it is Christian, conflicts can be resolved. If at all possible, by not going to law or by Christless argument, legalism seldom settles relationship problems that often drives them deeper. What Jesus meant means here is it is an atmosphere of Christian prayer, Christian love, Christian fellowship, that personal relationship may be right in. It is clear that Jesus makes a big assumption here that our fellowship in Christian and that because of that we judge everyone not on legalism but in the light of love. He puts it, if you refuse to listen, tell it to the church. Tell it to the church. So that's the fourth step, tell it to the church. The fifth is follows right afterward. If you refuse to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a gender and a text collector. In Matthew 18, verse 17. The advice to treat him as a gender and a text collector seems like very tough advice from Jesus. If you don't succeed, Jesus advises to treat the person as a gentile and a text collector. So the first impression here is to give up and treat the person as hopeless and abandon him or he as irreclaimable. However, Jesus never set limits to forgive human forgiveness. Remember what he told Peter, we must forgive 70 times 70, which means without limit. William Buckley reminds us in his commentary that when Jesus spoke of Gentiles and text collectors, he always did so with sympathy and gentleness, with the appreciation of their good qualities. It may be that Jesus was saying something like this, when you have done all this, when you have given the sinner every chance and when he remains stubborn, you may think he's no better than a tax collector and a gentile. Well, you might be right, but I have not found tax collectors and gentile hopeless. That is what William Buckley says. My experience of them is that they too have a heart that can be touched. And there are men of them like Matthew. He was a tax collector and he came to Christ. Zacchaeus was a tax collector and he came to Christ. Who have become my best friends, become best friends of Jesus. Even if the person is like a tax collector or a gentile, you can still win him, or as I've done. So, the scripture does not say to give up. In fact, it challenges us to win the heart, the hardest heart. It tells us that Jesus finds no person hopeless, neither must we. Reinhold neighbor writes, nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. 
Nothing we do, however vicious, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we are saved by love. No vicious act is quite as vicious from the standpoint of our friend or foe as it is from our standpoint. Therefore, we must be saved by the final form of love, which is forgiveness. Sure, we will have conflicts within the discipleship, within our congregation, within the church. Sure, it will be tough resolving. But our Savior tells us we can do it. We should do it. We must do it. If, it, if ours is a Christian fellowship and we are Christians, then we must do it. We must forgive. Be ready to forgive. So these are the things he put. Put your complaint in ways. That is the first thing. See him or her in person. Counsel with otherwise Christians. Make use of that Christian fellowship. Ne never give up the try. Try, try, try again. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. So I say, please don't lose hope. If a Christian brother, a Christian sister is not agreeing with you, we should keep them, not casting them out of our fellowship, but we should win them back to our fellowship. May the good Lord help you. May the good help help us as we continue to fellowship with one another. God bless you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are sorry that we keep your ways and your love to ourselves. That we do not challenge others when they stray from your ways. That we do not act as sentinels for your word in our community. That we fail to condemn what is wrong and uphold what is right. Forgive us. Give us wisdom, strength, and courage to be faithful and guidance for your way. Where there is conflict, bring reconciliation and peace between nations and races. When there is oppression and abuse, bring reconciliation and peace, Father. In places of work, where conditions are governed by profit and the humanity of employees is ignored. In local communities, where neighbors cannot agree, where rights are not respected. Between people of different faiths, different approaches to faith, different traditions. With our church, within our families, within our home, reconciling God. May we honor one another. See your image in your neighbor. And always work for justice, mercy, and peace. We pray in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, your loving Son, the one who died on the cross, who died for me and my brothers and sisters. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. As if you heard from Christ's words, Go and be go Christ's people. Listen, encourage, reconcile, and be strengthened in all your doing and all your being by the power of the loving God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. Mm.